faith and science have had a bit of a rocky relationship in the past and well okay they still do it's a bit rocky and heated because both faith and science claim absolute knowledge about how the world actually is and when these two contradict each other well, the one who happens to be in power at the moment gets to make the decision and leaves the other in a shamed silence. For example, 500 years ago, the Christian church proclaimed and claimed that God created the earth as the center of the universe which meant that the sun, moon, stars, everything revolved in orbit around the earth. This was the only acceptable answer for everybody, including scientists who were looking through telescopes and making observations. Because the church claimed to know, and no one else was allowed to speak. Of course, he was hardly the first person in history to make such a heliocentric claim, but our good friend Nicholas Copernicus came up and developed his own celestial model of the earth revolving around the sun. And for all of his trouble, his hypothesis and books that were published, he was quickly uh, labeled a heretic and his books were banned. Now, was this just a Roman Catholic bias against a heretic? You know, they've got a lot to deal with, and this is just one more. I would love to say, oh yeah, it was just a Catholic thing. But you know a guy by the name of Martin Luther, right? Yeah, our guy? Uh, he lived at the same time as Copernicus. And he had a few opinions about what Copernicus had to say. In fact, he didn't like his uh, sun-centered solar system at all, and he stood opposed to it. And one of Luther's students, Andreas Osiander, he was quoted as saying, this fool, Copernicus, is trying to turn the whole art of astronomy upside down. Well, it was more than just a war of words. It was a matter of life and death. The 16th century Roman Catholic monk named Giordano Bruno made the public statement that this infinite universe holds countless planets that harbor life. And for his contribution to the debate, he was burned at the stake, upside down and naked. Insult to injury. Oh yeah, faith and science, a bit of a rocky history in the past. But now, of course, the tables have completely been turned. Science is in control and the church is been relegated to a much, much lower level. And now, uh, of course, nobody would ever think of coming to a pastor or even a priest. Nobody would ever think going to the, a Christian church of any denomination and asking them honestly, will you please search the scriptures for us and come up with some good scientific evidence and data for the world around us? Not going to happen because that world belongs to the scientists. Those who can validate their data through observations and testings. All others today are demanded to be silent and bow before them. Faith has been relegated to the very low and insignificant level of personal convictions. It's merely what you believe, and to be honest, people believe all kinds of crazy stuff. It is hardly at the same level of how the world really is and knowledge. And to be honest, most of us in this room haven't really had a problem with this repositioning because we have grown up with a worldview that now has agreed with the arrangement that science knows and faith believes. In fact, even just hearing it this morning, you're like, well, yeah. My faith is what I believe, and, and science is what we know. Yeah, I, that sounds like a really great arrangement. But if you buy into this arrangement, you've given up far too much in the debate. And in the end, you're really left with nothing true or actual in reality to believe. Let me just play this out for you. 
In the last 10 years, astronomers have been making incredible discoveries. We have gone in this very short amount of time from just speculating that, you know, there are probably planets out in the universe, but we, we haven't seen them yet. We've gone from that position now in 10 years to having already identified 1,300 exoplanets. Planets outside of our solar system revolving around their own star. And some of these planets are in the Goldilocks zone. You know, not too hot, not too cold, but just right for the possibility of liquid water and breathable air. You know, with this in mind, it's not a big stretch of the imagination to consider that one of those planets, you know, might just harbor life. In fact, the day may come very soon in which we can stand on our planet and look far into space, into the atmosphere of this other planet, and determine the traces of elements that are there and can now say whether or not it harbors biological life. And if or when that day comes and we find life in such a place, what will that mean for your personal faith? Well, for you, probably not much. You know, we believe what we believe and science does what it does. And I'm not changing, you know. That's kind of how we are. But how will you enter the debate in a realistic and, and credible way? Do we have an answer for those who will say, see, see, we're, we're in, in any part of the universe, if the conditions are just right, like they are here on the earth, or any a number of other planets, why life will just naturally explode and come to life. You don't need a God. You're not special as a human being. You're just a couple of atoms that came together, woke up and said, hello world, that's it. How will you enter that debate? You see, if you have agreed with the arrangement that science knows and faith believes, all you have left is your personal feelings on the matter, or maybe what your church teaches. But you certainly are not on the level of knowing how things really are. See, then you have to kind of wonder, well, why do I believe what I believe? Now, of course, you won't because you're pretty stable in your faith. But you know who will ask those questions? Your kids and your grandkids. Well, why do we believe this? What's the evidence? What's it based upon? Is it simply because that's what the Bible says? Or is that what the church teaches? Yeah. We, if we go down that road, you really have nothing stable to stand upon. But the problem is you don't have to go down that road at all. You have a faith that is based upon knowledge of how things really are in the entire universe. And you can prove it to yourself. First, you have to realize that you know a lot of things that cannot be proven scientifically. Chemistry, biology, physics, they all prove a lot of things. But they don't prove anything from history. Right? Like everyone in this room, we all know it without a doubt that George Washington was the first president of the United States, right? Is there anyone here who thinks that's just my opinion? Okay, no, we're all, we're all on that same level of the highest authority, George Washington. Now, you cannot scientifically prove and test it. You can't go observe George Washington being the first president of the United States. You can't reproduce it, and yet we know it. We know all kinds of things from history because the answer from history gives the best answer for the data that we have available from historical records, artifacts, testimonies, eyewitnesses, corroboration from, un, uh, from sources outside of who have an interest in this. You can pull out a dollar bill and say, oh yeah, that's our first president. You see, your Christian faith is based upon the highest order of knowing history. That there really was a man named Jesus of Nazareth who lived 2,000 years ago. And there were people then who wrote down historical records of what he did, where he went, what he said. You can read their historical records. We have copies and copies and copies that go almost back to the original copies. And you can read them even right now in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the artifacts 
and the geography, they all cooperate in the stories of those who saw Jesus, who heard him. And if you wanted to get into a plane and fly over to Israel, you could go to Jerusalem and see the empty tomb of Jesus with your own eyes. Historical. Now, of course, none of this can be proven scientifically, and yet the best answer for all of the data that is available to us is that Jesus is exactly who he says he was. And that those who had witnessed him walk on the water, take the hand of the dead girl and raise her to life. Those who had seen him feed the thousands, speak to wind and wave and calm them. Those who saw him live, be crucified, and then place their hands in his living body after the resurrection. We have their story on historical records that have not changed since the very earliest uh, copies of what they've written. Now, of course, none of this historical record gives you faith. But at least we can know from those who saw Jesus that he truly was the one who's come from the Father. We've seen his glory. We've beheld him. And knowing then this historical Jesus, knowing those who have seen him and hearing their story, why, we can know that this Jesus was the one who was with God who made everything. And there was nothing that he did not make. And now you see then your faith is based upon something real, something knowable, but it doesn't give you faith. Jesus is the one who gives you faith. The real man who has risen from the dead, all who receive him, to those who believe on his name, he gives the right, right now, for you to become his child. Children born not of natural descent or human decision, but born of God. Your faith is based upon that much knowledge of how things really are because you know Jesus. So if we find life on another planet, cool, but it doesn't mean there's no God. It just gives glory to the God who made us. And look what else he made. And it really shouldn't surprise us. Look how much life he put, put on one planet. All the diversity of life. Wouldn't that just make sense if the whole universe were scattered with all kinds of different things that we're living? But whether we find it or not, you know what we know? We know that you're pretty special. And not just because your mama thinks so. You're pretty special as a human being because God himself became one of us. Think of all the choices he had. He could have gone to any number of galaxies. He could have populated any number of planets and become one of them. But he didn't. He chose this planet. He chose humanity. He made us a little bit lower than the angels. He set us in charge of all of his creation with Jesus himself as the one who is Lord and King over everything. Yeah, pretty special and amazing. And when Jesus comes again, he's bringing with him the new heavens and a new earth in which we will live with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a creation that's no longer groaning under our sin and its decay and death, but will be finally set free. And we will be with God forever and ever with our human bodies, with Jesus in His human body. You have something then to add to this conversation, even if you're not a scientist, even if you're not, you know, a theologian. You at least know the history. This Jesus walked the earth. This is what He said about Himself. And His resurrection is quite something you have to deal with about reality. So have a little more confidence then as you take your step into these. Have a little more winsomeness that you stand in a place of really knowing how things are. To him alone then be all glory and honor. Amen. We stand then. We make our confession of faith to this God saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty.
In our prayers this morning, then, we pray for people who are in need of God's special healing.